Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm very excited to bring a very practical and useful session to you today with our guest presenter, who I'll introduce in a moment. We're going to be looking at best practices, uh, how to respond to RFIs, tactical things that you can do to increase your chances of success uh, and to ensure efficiencies and that things are more effective for that. Uh, before we get started, a couple of words that I like to say about how we run our webinars here at GIS Planning. You will notice that you are muted. However, we very much welcome and encourage your questions and comments. And you can put those in the questions fields in the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, the other thing I'd like to let you know is that I am recording today's session, and I will be sending you an email tomorrow with a link to that video recording. You can share it with colleagues or review at your convenience. You'll also have contact information for our guest presenter and ways to respond if there's anything that you want to follow up on. Um, so uh, rest assured that you will be getting that in your inbox probably by tomorrow morning at the latest. So let's talk about best practices to RFIs. We are thrilled to have with us today um, Chuck Sexton, the CEO of Next Move Group. Hello, Chuck. Hello, thanks for having me, Alyssa, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. We are really excited to have this conversation. I know you have, uh, you and I have, have spoken a little bit about this. I was thrilled to be invited to be a guest on your podcast, which I will also encourage you all to check out if you have not yet seen it. Um, and I know that part of uh, your job in working on site selection projects is to think about RFIs and to look overall at the things that you really want economic developers to know when it comes to putting these together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn this over to you um, and let you do this presentation. And then we're going to take questions at the end. So just a reminder to folks that you can put that in the questions field and we will keep an eye out for that. Now I'm going to um, hand this over to you just so that you can do your presentation from here. So you should get a little uh, box up there on your screen. Great. I've got it. Uh-oh. My computer wants me to enter a security code. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something like that. Okay, right. there we go. We'll give you a, a moment or two to get those things up there. Um, I know that uh, you know part of what we were talking about as we were preparing this is that um, putting together proposals could be a very time-consuming thing for a lot of our clients to do. And certainly as you see them, you can see evidence of that, hopefully, hopefully the ones that people put a lot of time into. Uh, and so we like to be able to support that. We've built this proposal generator into our Zoom Prospector tools. A lot of people generate those also on their own. Uh, the idea is to find ways to make this as efficient as possible so that you don't have to keep coming up with these things over and over again. Let's see, Chuck, I see you as the presenter. Are you still, are you able to share that? You'll let me know if there's anything I can do to help you out on my end. We'll give him a, another moment to figure out. Sometimes you need to restart yep, your to, computer. Yep, it had to restart real quick. Uh, I have a Mac, and so it has all kinds of uh, security features, which I love, but it's right. also a little annoying sometimes. So. I got that, especially, you know, maybe GoToWebinar is a new one for you. So uh, yeah. so let's see if that works. You'll have to make me a presenter again so that I can get the sharing going and we can get started. Um, okay, so let me try and take that back then. I will make myself the presenter one more time. And then I will hand that back over to you, passing the baton. Let's Perfect. see. So let me know if this works for you. You got the little box up there on your screen or no? No, it's still not giving me sharing abilities for whatever reason. Okay, let me try making you the presenter on this side. Sometimes this will work because I have you as both an organizer and a presenter panelist. Does that seem any better? And if it doesn't, what I'm going to suggest is that, yeah, you think that's the way, that's the key? Yep. Okay. That's what did it. Perfect. There we go. Okay. Isn't that great? Success. So uh, again, apologize for the technical difficulties, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and I appreciate you sticking with us. So that happens from time to time. We have to use technology a lot nowadays uh, in economic development, site selection, and uh, I wanted to be able to share this with you today. And I appreciate Alyssa asking me to share this. I just want to give you a brief history as to how this came about. 
I was asked to do a session, a uh, site selection session at Basic Economic Development course last year. And then uh, we also have an educational program uh, at Next Move Group called The Movement. It's a membership program. We put out new content, new education every week. And one of our movement members asked if, hey, can you give us some sales tips when we're filling out RFIs to help us get more site visits? And so we kind of combined those two things into this presentation on RFI best practices. So um, as we get started here, and Alyssa, tell me if, if the screen's not changing. The things I want to cover today with this group uh, is defining an RFI, RFI versus RFPs, because as an economic developer, you're probably seeing RFPs sometimes instead of an RFI, the process scoring, walking through how to answer, some appropriate attachments, and some tips on selling in the RFI phase, which I think is the fun part. So I'm going to rush through this so we can get to some questions at the end. And so that you all know, um, Next Move Group, a lot of folks know us for executive search. Obviously, that is one part of our business. We do quite a bit of site selection these days. So, uh, and I do all of that for our firm, which is why I'm gonna go over this today because I see a lot of RFIs uh, and have uh, over the last year. So what do you consider a large purchase? The way I like to start this is I wanna get everybody in the mode of thinking about why it's important to fill your RFI out professionally, accurately, and sell your community. Some folks think an iPhone's a large purchase, which I guess it could be a Mac, which is what I'm using right now. Uh, I always like showing this one. Um, I didn't realize that was a large purchase until my wife decided to buy one. It's a kitty litter robot and and uh, desk for it to go into. Those are way more expensive than you would think they need to be. Uh, maybe a car or right now I'm looking for a house. I've been looking at all kinds of houses because I'm moving and starting a new office for us in Western Kentucky. And it's difficult right now. Housing prices are like 30% over what they should be and interest rates are crazy. These are all big purchases. Well, companies and corporate corporations, when they have worked with a site selector, if they're doing it on their own, they're about to make a major investment. We have one right now. It's a $500 million investment that they're about to make. And so if you think about that, I want you to think about the information you would want from someone who's selling you a home. If they're not detailed, if they're leaving answers blank to questions you've asked, it's going to cause you to have questions in your mind about whether or not you should trust the information that you're getting. So I think through this like this, when you're filling out an RFI, you wanna fill it out completely and you wanna be accurate and you wanna sell during that process to ease the risk in the mind of the client. So RFIs, as you all know, are utilized by site consultants, large accounting firms, companies directly, commercial realtors use them as well um, in gathering information. But what we use them for most of all is to eliminate you. The RFI stage is really we're, we've got to cull down sites, or, or you've probably heard the term down select. So uh, this past week, down selected from about 50 sites to about 15 sites on a particular project we're working on right now. And so those RFIs and the questions that you answer are used to eliminate and get us down to the sites that we're really going to focus on to go and visit. What's an RFP versus an RFI? So RFIs, they give a project description and overview. They're going to ask a lot of different questions in different categories like utilities, site information, uh, labor, workforce, all this different pieces. And you're we're probably going to see it in an Excel spreadsheet. If you're utilizing the new softwares that uh, uh, Global Location has, then uh, obviously you'll be able to do those online. Um, but it's going to be in some format where you're answering a lot of questions. An RFP, on the other hand, sometimes will come maybe in a PDF where it just gives you a general overview and tells you the key drivers of the project and allows you to put together a proposal based on those key drivers to give back. And so uh, that's sort of the difference between RFI and RFP. Both of them in both situations, you have opportunities to sell to the company and to the consultant from that perspective. So what does the process look like? When we're doing, uh, we send out RFIs and, and we're doing site selection, you know, we can eliminate your community and your site in multiple areas. We can be eliminated uh, when we come and meet in person. I mean, that's where, you know, that's kind of the heartbreaking part because they, you know, company comes to town, site consultant comes to town and you really think you're in the game and then you get eliminated. That, that really stinks. Sometimes you wish you got eliminated earlier. You can be eliminated when we do the site scoring. So you fill out the RFI, that comes to me, we score that, you could be eliminated at that point. You could be eliminated if you don't submit the RFI on time. <laughs> so you can be eliminated by the deadline point. You could be eliminated as we're preparing the RFI. So as we're putting this information together and we're working with our corporate clients, 
you may not fit quite in the geography. So you could be eliminated prior to even receiving an RFI. The must and wants alignment, very similar uh, to that. And then of course the geography approval. So when we are looking at RFIs, you submit those RFIs to a consultant. The question is then, what do you need to focus on uh, as you're preparing that? What do you, what does your goal need to be? Your big goal needs to be to not get any zeros on the scorecard. As we score these, this isn't like golf. You want a high score, you don't want a low score. And so we weigh every aspect of every answer that you give in that RFI is gonna to correlate to a score, usually on a scale of one to 10. And this is an example of one of our real score sheets. And you can see logistics, site characteristics, labor availability, distance to customers. Now, you can't tell exactly which questions these correlate to in an RFI. I do, I know, because I build them. <laughs> I build the RFI and I build the scoring pieces on here. There's a lot of uh, uh, fun Excel um, formulas that I have to put in here. But at any rate, based on your answers, and you'll see over here, I rank what the expected answers are going to be from the communities. And if your answer hits, you know, on, on this question, for example, there's a spur on site, you're going to get a 10. You notice down here, there's not even an answer to get a two and a half. If you say there's no rail availability, you're getting a zero. But one of the keys, and this is really important, that's why I wanna use this as an example. When you're filling out an RFI, let's say you don't have a spur on site. Maybe you don't even have the rail next to the site, and maybe it's not even close to the site. So are you gonna answer no to rail availability? Don't do that. If you have rail in your community, just not on the site, and you have the ability to do transload or intermodal, you wanna answer, there's no rail on site, but there is the ability to transload within the community because that answer will probably land you here instead of a zero. So again, you wanna eliminate zeros on your scoring when you submit an RFI and you have to think through how to answer these questions appropriately. This is a prime example. We have a client right now, I was on virtual site visits this morning. I've got a couple more this afternoon. And one of the things that we've told the communities is, look, this rail that's on these sites may not be used. It may be better to utilize intermodal. And we're giving them the option. If you have a site that's not on the rail, but you still have intermodal capacity, we might wanna look at that site versus the one that's directly on the rail. Things change and ebb and flow as you go through these projects. And, and some of that happens due to clients, customers, raw materials, and those sorts of things. So keep that in mind. You wanna, you wanna make sure you get a score on the board and not just a zero. So. How to answer the most basic keys to success when it comes to an RFI. It's number two on here, but I want you to be honest. Be honest with your answers. Don't fib, don't, uh, don't say things that you don't have. You don't wanna lose trust with a consultant. You also wanna make sure you're answering thoroughly in the manner that we request it, the way that we ask you to answer it, answer it that way. If you have to give some attachments or some addendums, make a note of that, that's okay but answer the questions that we've had the way we've asked you to give thought to each one. I would just feel, I just talked about this with the real, real question, for example, give thought to each one of those uh, RFI questions into how you can promote your community. And, and maybe you don't have an asset, for example, that that's right on site that needs to be on site. You need to answer those. Uh, a lot of communities, for example, may not have gas, natural gas at one of their industrial parks, but they've gone through the process and they've got letters from the gas company that's committed to get that in a certain amount of time. You want to make sure and give that information when you're filling out the RFI. Um, if you don't meet the precise need today, that's that's that example. And then spelling errors, <laughs> check for spelling errors. Check, make sure you're consistent with the way you answer them. Uh, use the same color and font <laughs> on each of your answers because we're looking through hundreds of these. Hundreds of these at any given time. And so if we're scanning and we start going quickly on scoring your sites and scoring your RFIs, sometimes we might miss that you answered a question that you really did because you didn't keep the color and font consistent with your answers. Appropriate attachments, the do's and don'ts, okay? The goal is to present your community in the best light possible. How do you do that? Well, you want to make it easy. And Again, like I just said, we score a lot of sites. And, and on the front end of these things, it's a lot of sites at once. It could be 10 states worth of sites. And again, that's happened a lot lately, it seems like. So what you wanna do is make it easy for us to find information. And you don't wanna send us on a hunt to find information either. So be careful about how you answer things and how you package 
your attachments that you're going to send that correlate to the site. And we're going to talk specifically about that in a second. Um, the dues. Send a PDF attachment. Try to keep it less than 15 megabytes in size. Some email servers don't like things even over 10 megabytes in size. Obviously, you can use Dropbox links and those sorts of things, and we'll talk about those. Make sure those pages, when you send a PDF attachment, if you pulled a lot of information together as an attachment for your RFI, you want those to be as uniform as possible because, again, a lot of times we're clicking through things, and one page is just like, I don't know, 10 megabytes of the 15 megabytes of the total thing. So what you want to do is try to scale those down. We're just trying to get a sense at the beginning. We don't have to have full-blown engineering drawings on the first set of the RFI. We'll get into that if we get to where we're coming to visit your site. Uh, apply your branding, or at minimum, your organization name on every page. It's always good to make sure as we're scoring things and we're looking through attachments and everything that your brand and the name of your organization, your community, whatever it is, is right there for us to see easily. Um, when it comes to links, always use descriptive file names. Uh, I really, so uh, another good example of this. So we went through the RFI stage with a, a lot of states right now on a, on a big lithium ion battery project. And as we're going through virtual site visits uh, the last week and through this week, you know, and I'm on these virtual calls with these communities, you know, I'm pulling up what they submitted in their RFI and their attachments. And it's really easy for me to have that conversation on the virtual site visit because these communities have done a very good job of being descriptive with those attachments. There might be 10, 15 attachments. I wanna look at the, the FEMA map, or I wanna look at the topo, or whatever it might be that I wanna bring up and discuss really quick on this virtual site visit, we can find it easily. Um, if there's a lot of documents, divide them up by subject. Bonus, include a file map as an attachment. I'm gonna give you an example real quick of, uh, of those maps. Um, the don'ts, and we'll get into these in a minute, but don't say see our site online without giving us a link. I'm going to give you an example of that happened to me uh, earlier this year with an RFI. Uh, don't send a link when you're asked to send a document. Uh, if, if we really want to get that document, you never know. We might be on the road. We might have a tough time uh, pulling things and downloading things, wh whatever it might be. Sometimes we just want to see the document rather than getting that. Don't overstuff your attachments. You want to sell your community. But if it's too much information, it might get ignored. So when you're doing your attachments and you're responding to these RFIs, really make sure that your attachments are super focused on the information that is critical to making the decision on the project. I've seen communities a lot of times and they have beautiful things that they send. I'm not saying that they aren't nice, but they'll overstuff their attachments with a bunch of information that's not relevant to the decision we're trying to make. And again, if we're quickly going through to score and down select so we can get to you know virtual visits and then site visits that just clouds everything and it you know if we've already seen a few sites that really work well we might start not paying attention to some things it happens and don't hide the pertinent information that was requested that kind of goes hand in hand so when you're selling in the rfi data is black and white and i say this a lot when we talk about labor analysis workforce development type things you know, I can pull all kinds of information on your community from a workforce perspective and data demographics perspective. A good labor analysis, if you've got marketing that came with it and those sorts of things, really paints a picture of your community in a better light than what I may receive utilizing JobsEQ or that sort of stuff. And so having that information, not just for labor information, but everything, think about how do I, as an economic developer, really paint the picture when we're responding and selling. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of that. We'll, we'll skip these here about this. This is a funny one. Um, <laughs> the post pandemic landscape, obviously workforce is a major problem uh, with every uh, client that we're working with right now and every community that we're working with too. And so you having a good grasp of that is really key right now uh, when, it, when it comes to selling. So I said labor, the other big issue we have right now is available sites and buildings. Those are the top two issues when we're looking. And so, you know, if you have a really solid site uh, in your community and you have a good workforce story, the opportunities are gonna be there for you to win new projects and win new jobs. So make sure that you're really painting the picture around those. When it comes to labor, you wanna sell short-term and long-term. So you wanna have information that comes into that RFI, succinct if possible, but you wanna be able to show that you can recruit, screen, and train for ramp up operations. Uh, you wanna show, say you have a low labor participation rate. There's a lot of communities out there that may, may be in the 55 to 57% LPR range. I know there's some who are lower than that. You wanna be able to answer the question then, how you are getting those discouraged workers 
back into the workforce because it's going to come up. If you get a site visit, that's going to come up, especially from us. Recent examples of your community helped the company bring uh, new new employees on board. And so that's another really key piece of information that helps paint the picture of what your labor looks like. If you have a, an industry who has just had a job fair and say they were looking for 50 uh, new positions to fill and 500 people showed up, you want to be able to tell that story really quickly as part of that RFI if possible. And then long-term. Long-term workforce issues, uh, programs in place with universities, being able to show how an industry has worked with, like say, for example, an engineering program. A lot of manufacturers right now are engineering focused heavy. Uh, I know our clients all are. And so being able to give an example of an industry who is working with a university or community college to recruit a uh, long-term pipeline from those university engineering programs is a very great thing for you to have as an example. Uh, and maybe as an attachment for the RFI. Um, understanding your talent pipeline, one that's not on here that I want to I want to briefly talk about from a long-term workforce, and you may think this is crazy, but we ask about housing development a lot right now. So when we're meeting with communities, it's you know, do you have a talent attraction program? Uh, what's your growth rate look like in your community? And are you addressing the needs of housing for workforce, long-term, managerial? all the different aspects and of course as you all probably all know the biggest shortfall we see right now is workforce housing a lot of communities are struggling with that so being able to answer those questions and sell your community based on those things are very good um, when it comes to available sites and buildings when you're answering the rfi you want to be able to if you can be aggressive in the rfi stage whatever your community allows you to do uh, being able to show you can lower the risk for a company as they're getting into that real estate some communities, you own the land yourself. In other communities, it's developers who own that land, so there's not as much you can do, but maybe your community has a unique incentive that helps to pay for that land or own that land from the developer uh, based on the project size. So being able to talk about those things in the RFI really helps as well. Uh, how prepared? Now, this is a big one, and then this is, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this part here, but your sites right now, are they as prepared as they should be? A lot of sites that we're going to, I'm finding some that don't have due diligence done. I'm finding sites that have a lot of trees on them. There's no clearing, grubbing, and grading going on. Uh, there's certainly very few out there that are pad ready or build ready, where some compaction has occurred on a specific portion of the land. And so if you truly want to be in the game and you want to be able to get more projects, activity, and site visits into your community, really focusing on site development and preparing those sites is extremely important right now. And it's not just mega sites. I mean, these are one off, a 50 acre site, 100 acre site, it could be a 20 acre site. Just getting those sites ready as much as possible. Uh, and don't say a site shovel ready unless it's been cleared, grubbed and graded. <laughs> I had that happen a lot this past year where I've gotten RFIs back and oh, shovel ready site, that's perfect. And then uh, I take a look at the uh, aerials of the site and go on Google Earth and hit Street View or whatever I might do, or even end up on a site visit. And that site's covered in trees. That's that's not a good thing. That's not shovel ready. Um, being able to tell top sales points of your community in the RFI, working those into the questions. And this really comes, it depends on your community and what your sales points are, but figuring out how you can work those into the RFI responses is really key. Uh, cutting red tape, streamlined permitting processes. Uh, I already mentioned creative incentive options. A stellar BRNE program. I'm going to tell you, I don't like placing my clients in communities that have a bad BRNE program. And so, and look, that word gets out from time to time. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing a really great job with your BRNE program. Because if if I find out that it's not good, I, I, I want to make sure when my client goes to a community they're taken care of long term. So that's important as well. You want to keep your marketing consistent, make sure that it looks good, branding is consistent, package your information well. Mapping. I'm going to hit this one really hard because I've seen this as a problem recently. And I'm going to give you examples from some of my old work and not some of the folks who have responded to RFIs. You always want to start big and then key in. And so, yeah, and I think this works both in the RFI stage as well as in the site visit stage. Don't assume someone knows where you are. You know your community, your state folks do, your utility folks do, but the people who are coming in, they do not know it. So you wanna start big and then zero in onto your site. So make sure you have a big map that shows, you know, all of North America if possible. Throw in some uh, major markets in there to really show you 
where you're headed. All right, then we're zooming in again. You can see those major markets. We're zooming in some more on that region, and then we're zooming in to the site. And so you want to start big and then go in to make sure folks know where you are, and then you want to have something that's specific to that site. Not everybody can have uh, you know, an engineering firm do nice industrial park maps for them and have multiple options on how they sell it, but I've seen economic developers who are very creative and do a good job of representing their site well using uh, paint or PowerPoint or Photoshop or InDesign or whatever. There's a multitude of programs to do that in. So making sure you have good marketing is good. And uh, before we get to questions, I wanna, I wanna show you a few things. So the good, you wanna answer every question. You want them to be concise, but ensure the information that was needed is in there. Uh, provide relevant, easy to understand, read maps, the location, uh, consistent text font, we talked about that, and try to minimize typos and spelling errors as much as possible. Uh, on our RFIs, if you've ever received one from us, one of the things that we like to do is we have a question uh, at the end of all of them, why should we choose your community in this property for this project? That's your chance to really sell some more. We want communities to have a chance to sell in the RFI process. And I really liked this one. This was, uh, I, I don't mind mentioning it, it was Murray, Kentucky. Uh, Mark Manning down there, he did a great job on this one um, and gave the top seven reasons to choose them. Now, the flip side of that is I've had communities who literally answer it with, we are a manufacturing town. That's it. That's all they say. And so that's not really taking advantage <laughs> of the ability to sell when we're, we're straight up asking you, please sell us on your community. Um, the bad, inconsistent text. So here, one of the, those examples, instead of you know keeping the answer red, you know, if this was in a Word document RFI instead of an Excel to RFI, you know, this looks like it's just part of that, looks like they may not have answered it. How many operations are regularly? Unknown. How many operate seven days per week? Unknown. What does that tell me? If you don't know, what your existing industry's operations are like, that means you probably don't have a good BRE program. So that's a red flag in an RFI. You wanna be able to answer those types of questions. And the, right here, we're a manufacturing city with related skills, like I just said on that answer. This one really irked me. Um, I, got, I got an answer on the site. Instead of placing the aerial of the site and building in the document like I asked, they just said Z, C Zoom Prospector and didn't even give me a link to it. So then I had to go and search uh, the state's website because they didn't even have their sites on their own economic development website. It was, a, it was a, a little bit of an annoying process. So, you know, please don't ever do anything like that. Make sure you're really focused on giving the good information. Um, there is, you know, the ugly. So price is high on this property. This is a good example. $1.5 million. They don't even have a first right of refusal. This is automatically getting kicked out. So, you know, some of this goes back to not just how you answer an RFI, but really how you're operating as an economic development entity or as a city or as a county or whatever. You want to make sure if you're promoting a piece of property, at minimum, you need to at least have that first right of refusal. Best case scenario, you own it. So think about those things. Uh, in this one, for example, they don't have a unionization rate. Yeah, you can get unionization rate really easily. I had to look it up. I knew that community had a high union, <laughs> unionization rate. They just didn't want to answer it. Uh, and so, again, that's a part of being honest and, and keeping us from having to go and dig on something when, you know, we've asked you all to do it. Um, typos are funny. Um, this uh, community apparently has uh, water and wastewater of 6 million GOD per day. Um, uh, they can be funny, but I have seen some that are uh, not funny and are bad. They, they don't look great. So make sure to, to get rid of those typos. Um, unanswered questions are the absolute worst. It happens way more often than it should. It shows laziness. It shows that the, you know, the community is not being aggressive or not paying attention. Uh, they're not putting care into their work. And, and that just, again, raises questions of risk in the mind of me as a site consultant, but also in obviously the mind of our corporate clients. Uh, and I'll end with this. If you answer every question, this is what my, my first mentor in economic development told me. If you answer every question on RFI correctly and professionally, you'll be better than 80% of the economic developers in the country. And, uh, you know, I didn't know how true that was when I was told that 15 years ago, but now uh, being on the site selection side of things, I can tell you that is 100% true and accurate. Uh, if you want to be a successful economic developer, answering RFIs correctly and professionally is obviously the thing to do. So uh, I want to be able to give some time for questions and answers uh, before I have to jump off here and do some more virtual site visits. So Alyssa, <laughs> if you're ready for that. 
Yeah, wow, this was great. I have to say, having spent many years working as a university professor, I feel like the things I told my students at the time would have really prepared them for writing responses to RFIs. Make sure your name is on every piece of paper. Make sure that you're using consistent fonts. Make sure you hand it in on time. Make sure, you know, you it's kind of like not just taking off the most basic boxes. I love that. Um, I'm also really interested in the idea that having links is so one of the brilliant things about Zoom Prospector is you can generate a link from any site, any report, any instance of analysis and put it directly in there. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that is uh, it really absolutely there. Don't expect the reader to do the work for you, right? As much as possible, you're leading them on a journey through all of this. So this was just fantastic and super, uh, super direct and very, very practical. Um, a couple of questions. Can we get a copy of the presentation? You can share your slide deck with me, uh, Chuck. I'll make sure that we include that um, with the follow-up email. Absolutely, Kylie, thanks for asking. Um, maybe just to, uh, another question. Uh, what is the number one things you want communities to know? Like, What is the one most important thing you want them to take away from this? Um, more than anything else, uh, it, there's actually two things. So one, um, make sure that you're given the appropriate care i know everybody's inundated with rfis right now and make sure that you're giving the appropriate amount of time to yourself to your staff and to your community to answer those rfis appropriately and put your best foot forward every single time don't take for granted that just because question might seem similar you can copy and paste from one rfi to the next because then we get it and the answer is totally off of what we expected so okay. you know, be very careful with that piece of it um, going back over, rereading, making sure like someone else's fresh eyes look at it before you turn oh, yeah. it in. Again, Proofread. advice Proofread I used to give my students. Important. So I really love that. Um, I know that we've built into Zoom Prospector the back end the online proposal generator. So if you have these kind of few marketing pages that help define the value proposition for your community, you don't need to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, and you talk about um, you know making sure that you deliver it as a document. If you have it also as a link, that way you can add any new properties or inventory that gets added after the delivery deadline. That way you can ensure that they get the, the site selectors get a chance to see the most up-to-date version of this. Yeah, um, I do like I do I do enjoy the states who utilize Zoom Prospector to its full capability where we're getting site submissions back and based on you know how I look at these RFIs, okay, I can go and download those links uh, or those attachments as I need them. Uh, if I'm going to continue with that site. So Absolutely. I do like that a lot. That's fantastic. And you know, there's a, all sorts of formats that you can share something like that in. So I think it makes sense. Um, I'm getting lots of thank yous for you. Another question, will the webinar be recorded? Yes, it is being recorded and I will share it with you by tomorrow so you can share this uh, with others. I think there was so much great information in here that I think it's really important. Um, Chuck, what is the most unique thing you've ever seen on an RFI, the most unique question? The most unique question I've seen on our on our that, that maybe I've put on an RFI. Um, I don't I, I don't I have to go back through some of them and look at them. Um, I, I think um, to me it's fairly unique when we ask the community, you know, how well, why should we or our client choose your community? I don't see a lot of uh, consultants who add that question in. And I think one of the reasons that we did is, you know, our executive team were all economic developers at one point or another in the past. And so we covet, you know, back in the day, we covered the opportunity to pitch our communities. And so we always like to afford that to communities as well. Now, from the standpoint of uniqueness that I've seen recently that I really like, um, there's one state in particular who's communities are doing a lot. So I don't know if they had an education program on this at their conference or what, but um, including a KMZ file. Yes. KMZ file that I can click on and it takes me straight to the site on Google Earth and it has everything built out and I can see and manipulate and look around. That's, I really love that. I, re I really enjoy that. That is actually one of the things we've also built into the Zoom Prospector uh, proposal generator because that's something we were hearing from site selectors is they want to be able to actually see that. So yep. that is really fantastic to hear that. Um, so much great information. I know there will be follow-up questions when people get a chance to go back and look at this again. I love that you include examples of ways that people kind of went wrong. And I love also that you talk about um, not making this a scavenger hunt because that is very much the same advice that I give our economic development clients for their websites. 
don't make things a scavenger hunt. Make things as easy as possible for people to find, save, and share information. Um, and I, I, what, I it doesn't have to do with RFIs, Alyssa, but you brought up websites. If you do not have your staff's contact information on your website, easy to find, you're not. That is basic first day. You've got to have that on there because one of the that's another huge pet peeve for consultants, especially, is we're trying to get a hold of someone because maybe we have a question that's you know could get your community into a site visit, and I can't even find your information. There's not a phone number. There's a contact form, and I don't want to go filling out a contact form. So yeah. the best of the best, they have their office number, cell phone number, email. If they have a pager, they've got that on there. So. Yes, I, I, I say the same thing. A human being's name also is so important, not just like info at edc.com, you know, so that people can track them down. Great. Okay. We are definitely on the same page. I know there's so much more we could talk about here, but um, maybe we have a follow-up webinar at some point, because I know this is really, really of interest to uh, to all the folks who joined us today. I want to thank you so much, Chuck, for, um, for being here today, for sharing your expertise. I know you're a super busy guy. Um, you and I are both going to be at FEDC meeting clients and all these different things next week. I look forward to seeing you there, maybe grab a drink. If you guys, any Florida clients here are going to be down there, come by and see us as well. Um, I again, we'll be sh following oh, up with sharing SEDC. Chuck's information. I'm going to be at SEDC. So oh, next you'll see Atlanta. Stevie. That's where I'm at next week. Okay, Stevie Chavez yeah. will be at SEDC. I will be at FEDC. We're I'll make Stevie buy me a drink while we're okay, there. Okay, well that's, and that's James, fair. Stevie and James both. They'll both have to there buy me one drink. Two, two drinks, even. <laughs> Um, okay, so you will hear from us with all this information. We thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy days. Chuck, we thank you for sharing your expertise. You will have our contact information there. And I wish you safe travels, and uh, we will be in touch. Thanks Goodbye. for having me. I appreciate it, Alyssa. Bye.